I guess the the coding and so I am really excited for today's talk uh, by Sarah West, who I'm going to introduce right now. If I find the right windows, of stuff, there we go. Um, so Sarah is a fourth year PhD candidate in the graduate program in neuroscience at the University of Minnesota. She was um, first inducted in network neuroscience to the in the network neuroscience world when she attended the 2019 Complex Network Winter Workshop in Quebec City. Outside of science, she enjoys playing Dungeons and Dragons with friends and training her two dogs in agility, dog sledding, and scent detection. So it seems like we're not going to get any dogs today, but a lot of neuroscience. So I'm excited for that. No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. They'll make a brief appearance. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm not getting the usual like light up screen. Okay. All right. So yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I, um, I'm Sarah, as Alice said, and I work at the University of Minnesota in uh, the lab of Timothy Ebner. And I am studying the dynamic cortical networks during locomotion using wide field calcium imaging. And I will get to the details of what all of that means as we get there. Um, I do have a preprint out. Um, it's on BioArchive with the same name as this talk. Um, a lot of stuff, you can go and look at it if you wanna know some of the details, but a lot of it is changing so far and I will be showing you the new analysis today, um, but we're hopefully going to be um, getting that resubmitted and published soon. All right, so uh, network science is used in neuroscience quite a bit these days. It's kind of a new trend, but everyone's very excited about it. Um, so can you guys see my pointer? Yes, okay. Um, so you can make networks out, out of different um, individual neurons, so the cells, the main cell of the brain, you can see how they um, are connected to one another or how they fire together. And you can look at these different spatial scales going from these individual cells up to groups of cells and up to high level, um, uh, high level view of the brain divided into um, functional regions, for example. And then there are also different um, skills and time that you can look at it. So here, um, this is a review from Daniel Bassett's uh, lab and she gives examples of how you can compare connectivity in different evolutionary time scales to see how the brain evolved. You can look across um, development or the life, lifespan of your subjects. So from um, childhood to adolescence, to adulthood, to aging, um, that's very a very popular subject in neuroscience right now. So Alzheimer's research has a lot of network science um, applications um, because it's it's been shown that as Alzheimer's progresses, a lot of like the hub regions of the brain are deteriorating. So that's cool. Um, and then also you can look at instantaneous connectivity in the brain. So usually that, what that means is you take a connectivity value at a given point in time, you take just one value for a given condition or time period. So these are different trials in this figure, but it could be like this brain under this drug or this brain under this other drug or normal. Um, and there are a lot of clinical trials, um, well not clinical trials, but different experiments looking at how um, maybe like diseases affect the brain. So you might have a normal patient and then a patient with schizophrenia sitting in an FR MRI machine looking at how their brains are functionally connected. Um, so there are also two different ways that you can look at the network science of the brain. Um, so you have the structural connectivity, um, which is, refers to the actual anatomical connections between cells and regions. So if you're looking at individual cells or individual neurons, you're looking at how the um, axons, the different appendages of the neurons are um, connecting to other neurons. Or if you're looking between regions, you're usually looking at large bundles of axons and how they go from one region to another. Um, 
And then we also have functional connectivity, which is based on what's actually happening with the activity of those neurons or regions in a given amount of time. So while these cells or regions are physically connected, they're not necessarily sending in from, they're not necessarily firing and sending information to another region. So, so that's a different aspect to the, um, to the connectivity. So there's the potential maximum structural connectivity and then what's actually happening in real time, the functional connectivity. Um, and you can look at um, the similarity of different activities between regions or neurons, um, often the correlation values. Um, and that has been shown to reflect um, underlying connections. So if one region is fire is um, active over time and then another region is active over time and they're highly correlated, it does tend to mean that this region is activating this region or one way or the other. Um, of course, we get into problems of are they directly connecting to one another or are they indirectly connected? And that's still a mystery in many senses because we don't know much about the brain at all. So I am interested in the uh, motor side of the brain. So um, motor behavior is just generating any kind of movement um, of the body. And it's a big deal for the brain to be in control of that. Um, classically, we think of the brain as divided into different functional regions that have their own job to do. So um, the motor behavior involves regions up here in the cerebral cortex, particularly the primary motor cortex, that's the M1, um, that is known to control um, specific arm, leg, limb movements. Um, we have, I think my cursor keeps disappearing and it's throwing me off, but okay. Um, and then we have this region up here called the premotor cortex, which is involved in planning the movements that the primary motor cortex is involved with. And then we have subcortical structures like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. Those are tend to be involved in regulating the uh, movements that you have. So for, I'm not going to be going into this today because I'm focused on the cortex, but these regions, for example, um, the cerebellum is thought to, um, if you want to have a smooth movement with your arm, the cerebellum is thought to be involved in keeping it from being jagged and jumpy. It takes errors and feeds that back to back to the cortex and it, and it allows for adjustments of movements. So there's a lot going on in motor behavior. And this is all before we even get down to the brainstem and the spinal cord, which actually execute the movement. Um, so that's a classic understanding of how uh, the brain is involved in movement. But as our technology has been enhancing over the last few decades and we can um, record activity of neurons from more and more places at the same time. So for example, this is um, electrophysiology recording, which is you stick an electrode in the brain and the electrode can pick up the um, electrical gradients actually created by the neurons and you can record individual neuron action potentials, which are the neuron firings. Um, and so they put these electrodes all over different parts of this, this mouse brain. This is a mouse. Um, and they found that across all of these different areas, there's a certain, um, a certain percentage of neurons would encode visual encoding but then when they look also at the action encoding, so whenever the mouse moves, they found cells in just about every single region had some involvement with action encoding. So when the mouse moved, the neurons would change their firing. And this is something that we're also, that we're seeing many different places. This is the same technique that I'm using, but done from a different lab. This is wide field calcium imaging. And I'll tell you how wide field cal how calcium imaging works in a bit, but basically the brain lights up in places that are active, whoops, in places that are active and you can see it as actual light coming from this mouse brain. Um, and in this, this experiment, they cleared off the brain so they could see all of the top part of the cortex at once. And whenever, so the mouse is, was sitting there just hanging out and they taught it to do a task where it like would press a button with its tongue but whenever it was just sitting there and kind of fidgeting around, they found that all of this region, all of what they could see basically 
was modulated by those movements. So we're finding that not just these very specific regions of the brain are involved in um, whoops, movement execution. It seems to be involving just about everything. Uh, okay, I've never tried to do a chat and talk at the Oh, okay. There was a question from Nick. Uh, Nick is asking, what does clear the skull mean? Right, so clear the skull, that can mean different things based on different groups. Um, this group, um, they, I don't know exactly how it works, but it's like a material, it's like a glue that you apply that then makes the bone optically clear. So I don't know the exact technique of how that works, but a, a lot of people use it. Um, in my lab, we use a piece of plastic that's actually molded, 3D printed to fit on the mouse's brain. And I can show you that when we get closer to. Um, so you basically remove the skull, replace it with this window, and then the mouse can live with this window in its head for the rest of its life. All right. Uh-oh. Okay, there we go. We're back now. Um, I'm gonna try finding the laser pointer, but I think Zoom is gonna block me from all of those. So if you can click this, there's, there's a, the laser pointer should be in the lower uh, left corner. It's one of those circles. Wait, oh. Okay. I think the, the one I that, see. yeah, that one. Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so as we're, as we're doing more and more research into um, what's happening during movement in the brain, we're learning that movement actually involves a mass recruit, recruitment of neural circuits across the brain, but we're not sure how this is happening. So that is where my research is coming in to try to help clarify um, why all these regions are activating and how, what they're all doing during movement. Um, so I am specifically looking at locomotion, which is um, just the movement from one location to another. So walking, running, skipping, crawling, whatever you want to, whatever you want to be doing. Um, locomotion is interesting because it uses distinct mechanisms from other types of movement. So if you want to move your hand from here and like reach out and touch something, that's actually uses a lot of different neural mechanisms than trying to walk. And not many people have done that yet because a lot of, there are a lot of technical challenges because you need to both get whole brain imaging and you need to have the person or whoever, you're, whatever you're studying, be able to walk forward and see everything at the same time. So no one's really been able to do that yet. And that is a nice novel aspect to my research. So locomotion, what makes it particularly unique um, so down here in the this is a diagram of the ner nervous system um, down here is the spinal cord so the spinal cord within it has um, different networks of neurons that if you activate it like you send electricity into into those circuits um, there will be an oscillating pattern of these neurons activating one another and they can actually control the pattern of walking on their own. So if you send, you can send um, electricity in and you can make an animal start walking. So that's pretty cool, but we're also getting a lot of cortex involvement. Um, a lot of people are studying how the spinal cord controls locomotion, which is really cool, um, but not many people look into the cortex. I think this is Drew and Marigold. They're like one of the only other groups that I've seen work looking at this. But what we know so far about uh, cortical control of locomotion, that the motor cortex, that primary motor cortex is in, important in uh, modulating these different circuits. And it seems to be um, involved in, so whenever you need to change the cycle of the footfall, that's involved and it seems to um, adjust the actual muscle movements and then we also have this posterior parietal cortex, which is in kind of the back of the head. Um, it's involved 
also in motor planning, in navigation, and um, integrating sensory information from all of the different senses that you have. So this will take in um, information from the what's called the retrosplenial cortex, which is very heavily involved in navigation, the visual cortex, which is obviously taking care of um, taking in visual information, and it integrates that into um, information that's usable by the motor cortex. That's the ongoing theory. Um, and then there are the subcortical structures that are involved and in premotor cortex um, is likely involved. This is a planning area, but not much is known about that region in locomotion. So here's um, just a bit more explanation of how these different regions contribute to locomotion. So this is a primary motor cortex. Um, so each, each of these different colors is a different um, um, type of modulation to this cat's um, walking gait. And up here is the, um, the trace of the how fast a specific neuron that, cor that corresponds to a muscle in a leg, how fast that um, neuron is firing while the cat steps over the various obstacles. So what it's showing here is that the neurons in the primary motor cortex increase in firing high, um, very similar to how the muscle is activated. So it's kind of a, um, not one-to-one, -one, but a direct relationship to the muscle activity. And then over here, this is the same group, still that um, Drew and Marigold group. Um, this is in that posterior parietal cortex, which helps with the navigation and the planning of movement and integration of sensory information. Um, so again, they've stuck a, stuck a neuron in this region, and this is the um, firing rate of, of the neurons that they see in that region. And then down here, this is um, a recording of muscle activity in the front limb and recording of muscle activity in the hind limb. So what's interesting is here is this cat is walking towards an obstacle that it sees coming, and this is the obstacle here. And when, it re when its front legs reach that obstacle, the um, firing rate of the posterior parietal cortex goes up, but then it stays high even when the cat can't see the obstacle anymore, but it knows that its hind limbs are gonna, um, gonna run into the obstacle soon. So that stays high until the hind limbs pass through. So there's information in this region encoding the obstacle and how the cat needs to get around it. Um, and then down here, this is the primary visual cortex. So this, the visual cortex is not directly involved in motor production because it's involved with taking in visual information. However, it's been known for a while that if an animal is walking, the way the visual cortex processes visual information changes. And there's a lot of experts in this field that know how it's changing, but it becomes more sensitive in general to different visual inputs. And this is likely because you need to change how you're interpreting the visual field as it comes closer to you. So here, this is a, um, an electrophysiology recording um, with, with each dot doing um, being different instances of when this mouse is at rest or walking. So this is the cell's normal, um, normal firing rate at rest and then the firing rate at, or I'm sorry, this is its normal firing rate. This is the firing rate at locomotion. You have to normalize it to how fast the neuron likes to fire at um, um, when there's nothing happening. So here's the firing at rest, then the firing goes up with locomotion. So this will actually happen even when the visual field isn't changing. So if you put a mouse or a cat or whatever you have on a treadmill, which is like a blank wall in front of it, and it starts walking, this firing rate still goes up, even though it's just still looking at that same blank wall. So that's showing that there's something about locomotion that um, is telling the rest of the brain to change the way it's processing sensory information. So it's very cool about how all of these different regions are being grouped together with motion. So 
I would like to know how this mass recruit recruitment of neurons across the brain um, happens during locomotion and how that basically um, shifting calculations in regions like the visual cortex might be happening. Um, so my hypothesis of, of my work is that uh, changes in functional networks between um, cerebral cortical regions will facilitate change in the cortical processing. And then I tested this with wide field calcium imaging during spontaneous locomotion in mice with these implanted op optic windows that I mentioned before. And I'll show you how that works. So this is um, the basis of fluorescent calcium imaging. So what you need is a mouse that's transgenic. So this mouse is from a line that has a gene that expresses a fancy protein inside its neurons. And it's born that way, you breed them and you have them in your lab and you can buy them from different companies. But way back when someone made this transgenic line for us. So these mice will express this protein in their excitatory neurons of the cortex. And this protein is called GCAMP6. Um, so what this does, it's a protein that is sensitive to calcium attached to a fluorophore. So calcium will go up during action potentials or during neuron firing. And when that happens, um, the protein opens up and allows um, a protein that's sensitive to fluorescent light to be exposed to fluorescent, to the air. So if you shine a fluorescent light on it, that fluorophore, fluorophore will um, fluoresce back. So if you expose a neuron um, that's expressing GCAMP6 to a fluorescent light, as the neuron fires, so each of these tick marks are when it's firing, um, you'll see an increase in fluorescence in time with those neurons. So the way I do this, I have my mice um, and they're expressing their, they're expressing their G-camp and I expose the top of the cortex to an epifluorescence microscope, um, wide field for fluorescence, fluorescent light with a microscope and camera come um, up above it. So when I expose the brain, I can see not all the way down the cortex, but into these first few layers. All um, polymer, there's a thin polymer plastic that covers up the brain itself. Um, and we implant this in the mouse. And when the mouse is underneath the microscope, this is the view that we get. Um, so this is the approximate um, mouse brain regions that we can see with these windows. So we get these pre, so M2 is like the premotor regions. Um, that's the purple. We get um, primary motor regions in the blue. Um, and then somatosensory, which is um, like touch regions, and then um, visual and other parietal regions, and then these retrosplenial navigation regions. The yellow is the barrel fields, which are what the mouse um, uses to interpret whisker inputs. So um, my recordings, I put my, so I put my mice underneath the microscope and I record them all for um, one hour for a given session at um, a 20 Hertz recording or uh, 20 frames per second videos at a um, resolution of 256 by 256 pixels. And I have a total of about 60 hours of, the, of these videos. I think I saw someone have a question. Did someone have a question? Oh, yeah. uh, I just think somebody uh, just entered the session. Oh. That's what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we do uh, take pictures while the mouse is moving. So, okay, thank you. Yeah.
yeah, so, so the mouse will sit there at rest sometimes and then sometimes it decides to start walking and then the camera will be running during that time. Yes, so this is what we see um, over time through the microscope. So this is the, um, the change in fluorescence um, from a baseline at up here is locomotion and down here is rest. This blue line is the treadmill velocity during locomotion. And then at, for completeness, the treadmill velocity at rest. So at rest, we get so too exciting. Um, it's kind of a dynamic process. Different regions are uh, lighting up in, in their own time. But when the mouse is walking, we see large increases in activity all over the cortex that we can see. So that's good. That agrees with what others have shown that there's a large um, recruitment of activity um, during movement. So um, next I process these videos to make them into something I can actually use. So if you're looking at these, you might be noticing like, oh, that looks like not brain, that looks like a blood vessel on these mouse brains. So that's not great. So I have to go through and um, pre-process these videos to remove noise. So my first steps is to um, remove any movement artifact by registering each frame together. Because even, even though the mouse is um, secured in place under the microscope, the brain itself will move a little bit because it's just kind of floating in a bag of fluid, which is how brains sit inside your skull. So for, I have to register each frame of those brains. And then I also draw masks, like little squares over the blood vessels and of, over the background. And I take that background activity and I regress it out from the rest of the brain. So then I'm left with residuals that do not contain um, background fluctuations or um, any fluctuations that might be from blood flow. Because blood flow can affect the um, uh, brightness of the fluorescence. Then I also took out any high frequency activity above seven hertz because that's above the rate um, that the that the calcium um, fluorescence will be uh, um, activating and decaying. And then next, so these videos are thousands and thousands of pixels per frame, so I have to reduce it down to something again that I can use. Um, so I use independent component analysis. So first I um, take all of the videos that I have, put them together and um, compress them with singular value de decomposition. And then I use the reduced, I take the reduced data and run spatial in, in, um, independent, if you're not familiar, independent component analysis, um, finds um, all of the most uh, relative sources of a signal um, and separates them out um, based on how um, linearly independent they are. And usually it looks at how Gaussian the signals are with in relation to one another. So it'll split them apart that way. I'm not a math person. So let me know if I say anything that makes no sense and I'll try to describe it again. <laughs> um, Okay, great. I got a thumbs up from Phil. Okay. So with that, that breaks it down into different functional regions like this. So these are these spatial independent components and they actually look really nice. They divide the brain nicely into these functional regions. And if you compare over to this map over here, they tend to lie within, um, reasonable uh, subsections of these areas. So for example, this is the somatosensory region. We know that the somatosensory region is divided into different parts of the body. So up here, you might have the um, front arm of the mouse, or these neurons are sensitive to touches that come to the front arm of the mouse. And back here is the, the um, leg of the mouse. And we're seeing those divisions here in these independent components. So here you may be getting a back limb and over here, you're getting the front limb. And a lot of these come um, in symmetric pairs, which is good. Occasionally you get 
them together. Um, the reason we do this whole complicated process of independent component analysis to break it into these regions instead of say taking this map and slapping it on to divide it up is because the, um, the anatomy between individual mice or individual people, individuals anywhere actually varies quite a bit. This map here is a big um, composite map that was done by some very smart people and it's very useful in many ways. But if I laid this map over all of my eight mice, some of them would have a somatosensory leg region here, but some of them might have it like down here or over here. There's quite a bit of variation. So we wanted to be sure that we were catching that variation in some other way. So um, I take these regions. Um, if there were two in the same independent component, I split them up um, just for ease of calculations. And um, I thresholded these into uh, masks those look like this. So for each of my eight ma mice, I formed a catalog of their relevant functional regions. And it ranged from about 20 to 25 in an individual mouse. But you can go across these different mice and find the regions that are consistent across them. So yes, there's a lot of anatomical variation between individuals, but there are some relative consistencies that you can find to make your map again. So I found 28 regions that were pretty consistent across these mice. And these are the approximate locations of all of those. Um, yeah. So then I took these masks and I extracted time series of the fluorescence videos um, with those masks. So that will end up like this. So this is an example of mouse one. Um, I take these masks, go back to the pre-processed video and average the fluorescence changes that come out of say this region. And it gives me one time series. So I will have a total of, since I have the 28 regions, I have 28 time series. So um, that's what this, this looks like. And you can see at rest, there's some certain amount of activity, but it's staying kind of down towards this baseline. But with movement onset, we do see that increase like we saw before, and it stays high until movement offset. Um, down here is the corresponding um, treadmill velocity. So it stays at zero and then it goes up and stays high and then goes back down. Um, so from here, I wanted to divide the data into um, relevant behavioral periods for analysis. So the way I did this was I found the movement onset and offset for each period of locomotion. And I split, um, and I took the data from three seconds before and three seconds after and called those um, one of four transition periods. So I have one right before, one right after on onset, right before and after offset. And those are three seconds each. I chose three seconds because that gives me about 60 data points, which becomes important later when I start taking correlations. So I wanted to be sure I had enough data points um, corresponding to a correlation. Um, so then anything in here that's not included in these transition periods that's still locomotion, I count it as something called continued locomotion. And I do that because I wanted to know once the mouse enters a steady state of walking, not thinking about starting or stopping, they're just going, I wanna know what the brain is doing, doing during that period. And then anything outside of these um, transition periods at rest is just labeled rest. All right. I tend to confuse people when I explain this. So let me know if anything's confusing. All right. And then from there, I take um, all of the data from these six behavioral periods and um, up here is the average time series from the 28 regions um, fr from these different behavioral periods. So again, we see um, low activity. And then in all of these, almost all of these regions, there's an increase in activity that then stabilizes at an elevated level and then decreases down again and returns to rest. Um, and down here is the average um, treadmill velocity. 
and I got quite a bit of walking as about 10% of the time mice were walking. Um, although yeah, there's a lot, of, they also spent a lot of time just sitting there, which was great. And then, um, so I broke it down into the pre uh, movement preparation periods, initiation periods, continued periods, stop right before they stop and then right after they stop. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the network science, yay. Oh Lord, okay, it's already 142. Okay, um, so my next question is how are these regions functionally connected during these behavior periods? Okay. Um, all right, so this is what the correlation matrices during these different behavior periods look like. So up here are the adjacency matrices um, with a correlation coefficient going from zero to one. Um, and down here are the, now the, the thinnest um, edges of these graphs are 0.25 up to, and then the thickest are a coefficient of one. And then the size of the different regions correspond to the strength of that node. Um, so just looking at these raw correlations, um, it's not super exciting, but there are sub subtle differences. So at rest, you can, there's um, a higher or a dense um, collection of correlations here in these middle regions, kind of in these um, somatosensory and parietal regions back here. But those dip down some during walking. However, things get interesting when we directly compare between rest and locomotion. So I um, looked at the significant changes in the correlation coefficient um, between rest and continued locomotion. And I found the significance based on a um, permutation t-test with Bonferroni correction. Um, so what we can see here is that we're generally getting a decrease in correlation in a lot of these um, middle parietal regions. But most interestingly, we're finding an increase in these pre premotor regions to quite a few of the other regions. You can see that down here. And this is the strength of the increase. So we're getting increases um, in the correlations in these premotor regions and in these um, retrosplenial regions. So that was actually surprising when I first found this. So a lot of the, a lot of the um, neuroscience community would have thought that the correlations would just generally go up because there's just so much more activity and we won't be able to see anything. That was one, one thought. And another thought was, oh, maybe the motor cortex is just planning everything. The primary motor cortex is gonna be coordinating all this information um, and taking it in to adjust the gait. That's not what, what we found. We found that those primary motor regions are actually decreasing the most, these pr uh, primary motor regions and somatosensory regions, whereas the, it's these pre pre-motor, pre um, pre-motor anterior motor regions way up front that are, that are increasing in correlation. So that's really interesting because that was the region up in that earlier diagram that I had that I said, no one really knows what it's doing during locomotion. All right, and then this is the same, this is the same thing, but between all of the six behavioral periods that I had. Um, so up here, um, so this is, so each one of these um, labels is one of the six behavioral periods. And then these lines show which two behavioral periods I'm comparing. And so what we see is that after a general increase in um, connectivity right before movement, um, there's a lot of decreasing again as the mouse gets into the, into the locomotion, but these premotor regions stay high in connectivity. So that's really cool. Um, and we also see that the retrosplenial regions in increase in connectivity right before walking. So what I think this means is that um, before the mouse starts walking, they're taking in information about what's right in front of them and their navigational senses, and then they start going, and then the premotor regions start um, taking over the coordination of information from different regions and turning that into a motor plan. And then this all reverses when they go back to rest. All right, and this is one of the most ugly graphs I've ever made, but I 
ran out of time to come up with something better. Um, so this is the eigenvector centrality of my 28 regions during my six behavioral periods. So regions going this way and then my six behavioral periods. So um, in general, so uh, these milling regions are highly connected with other regions in the brain. But when we look at these three periods where the mouse is walking, so right after they've begun walking and when they're continuing walking and right before they stop, we see kind of an evening out of the centrality across these different regions. And then it returns to the way it was at rest. So here is the change in centrality from these different regions. So from again, from rest to continue locomotion, we see a really strong relationship or a strong result showing that these premotor regions increase in centrality from if you look directly from rest to locomotion. And then down here, you've got your retrosplenial regions also increasing. But interestingly, a lot of these motor regions, these somatosensory regions are decreasing. Um, I think I got a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> People like my brain networks. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and then down here, again, where sh I'm showing the centrality um, changing from period to period. Um, and it supports what I found before that um, these retrosplenial navigation regions are increasing in their centrality. So they're probably connecting to and taking in information or sending out information um, about the space in front of the mouse. And then that then um, the premotor regions take over once the mouse is actually moving. And then it re reverses again once it reaches rest. I love that I can just be start saying network terms to you guys. This is usually the hardest part to explain to the neuroscience crowd, but okay. <laughs> okay, so my next question is, um, are these highly correlated regions sending information out to the rest of the cortex or are they receiving information? So is M2 coordinating all these regions or are all of the regions dumping information into M2. And the same question for retrosplenial regions. With correlation, it's a um, uh, it's an undirection, undirected measure. So my next step was to figure out a directed measure that would actually give me something useful. So what I used is something called Granger causality. Um, and it's a popular tool in neuroscience. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about it outside of neuroscience, but let me know if I'm being redundant. Um, so the idea of it is if you have two um, variables, y and x, um, and you want to know if y causes x, you can figure that out by looking at the history of both x and y to predict the next value of x. So you model both variables as um, an autoregressive auto model um, for a number of uh, time lags in time before your current value. And I chose to use um, 20 lags in time because that's about one second. And it's a, anything longer than that, you're kind of wondering if it's relevant on a neural scale. Um, so basically what you do, you model the X time series or the X variable, and you have a certain amount of error left over. Um, and then you also model the X based on its past and the past of Y and you're left with another error variable. And then the Granger causality looks at the um, natural log of the ratio of those, um, of those uh, error covariance matrices. I hope that all made sense <laughs> to the math people. Okay, good. Okay, so it's basically a ratio of error with and without the um, information provided by the other variables that you have. So if I apply that to my data, I get something like this. So my data, so my data isn't particularly strong. It doesn't have a particularly strong causality um, to it, but it's similar to what other people have found with this sort of um, calcium imaging. Um, so it goes up to um, this low looking number of 0.015. But um, you read these looking at, you guys are network people, you know how to read these to this side and then from this region. Um, and we can see when 
you can sort of see when the mouse is walking. There's some vertical lines maybe coming um, from the M2 or from these first two most forward regions and maybe from like these back regions here. But the way these values are calculated, um, this Granger causality, causality is calculated. It calculates um, how much is X causing Y, but also how much is Y causing X. So to simplify things, um, I basically subtracted one half of this triangle by the other half. So I got one total directionality value between two regions. Let me know if that's a bad idea. <laughs> no one in there, I haven't found anything saying that I can't do that, but I've done that so far. Um, and you can start to see a little bit more um, patterns happening here in this causality. So um, um, over here, once the mouse is walking, you can see outward um, activity coming from these anterior motor regions. Um, and also a little bit of outward activity coming from these um, more posterior regions. Um, you can really, then I took basically the strengths of these, um, of these values and summarize it again in a very ugly graph. Um, so from these different, um, from these different regions, um, I made positive values in information coming in for these different behavioral periods. And what this shows is that these anterior uh, motor regions are very much sending information out. So that's cool. It very much seems like this is um, the uh, premotor regions are coordinating the rest of the cortex to um, integrate all these neural circuits into a um, functional cohesive unit. Um, interestingly, like we were talking about how the retrosplenial regions, those navigation regions back here are, they're highly connected, but I was finding that there's not really a decent total causality happening here. So it seems like those regions are sending information in and receiving a lot of information. So that's very interesting. We're getting something different between these two. Um, all of these from like 25 and back, those are all of these posterior regions that um, correspond to visual cortex. But it's very interesting. It, it, there's a sharp divide between like up to 19 and 21, those are receiving information. Primary regions are receiving information, also very interesting. Um, and here you might be curious about these. This is 17 and 18, which are those whisker regions. Um, in my previous graphs, I didn't show that they were particularly well connected to the other regions, but they're mostly sending out information, which makes sense because these mice they're using their whiskers, they're flapping them all over the place when they start walking and they're getting, uh, sending out information about what's in front of them. Um, all right, so that's what I have so far. Um, my next steps will be to calculate the sig significant, the significant changes of all these Granger causality measures. Um, I have everything kind of set up right now. I have all of my null um, distribution set up. I just need to actually do the significant changes and hopefully a lot of these relationships hold up. Um, something else I need to do, I want to repeat a lot of these correlation analyses with out this huge um, offset in activity because this huge increase in activity is going to drive the correlation values up. Same with the decrease, you're going to get increases in correlations. And we're also, we're interested to see if there's more subtle relationships having it um, happening within these increases without that um, without that large offset. So my next step is I'm going to filter this out with a low pass filter, or with a that's supposed to say high pass high pass filter. All right. So conclusion. So although cortical calcium activity does increase across the cortex during locomotion the correlation between different regions varies depending on the regions. Um, and then regions such as anterior motor, um, retrosplenial and visual regions become high, highly functional, functionally connected to other regions 
while regions like primary motor and other parietal like somatosensory regions becomes less connected. Um, and some of these, um, some of these cortical regions that increase in their connectivity, um, they do tend to send information out um, and they may be involved in switching the cortex to a new computational state for locomotion. Um, future directions. So something I'd like to try next is um, something called two photon mic microscopy. So I've been using single photon microscopy. So um, with these um, fluorescent um, molecules, you're hitting it with a certain amount of energy with your microscope, which then allows it to fluoresce. So with two photon microscopy, you're changing the amount of energy that you're sending to the molecule um, with NAP, the energy is lowered, so it has to be hit with two photons before it lights up. And that allows you to really angle in where you are hitting your light. So this is an example showing that it'll only start fluorescing on this very narrow plane up here, or no, this, this very narrow point in the middle here versus all up and down like I have. And this is cool because it lets you look at specific cells. So here is an image from my lab from two photon imaging. All of these little donut shapes of um, brightness are individual neurons um, from the layers of the cortex that we're interested in. And you can record from these for long periods of time from whatever regions you want with our, with our um, wide field windows. And I would like to um, calculate functional networks between those neurons. Um, I haven't been able to find anything suggesting that people have done something like this in locomotion in, in, this, um, in these um, premotor regions. Um, and I'd like to look at, so this premotor region in the mouse is that M2, what's called M2. And there's actually a lot of different studies treating different subparts of it differently, but no one ever brings that all together. And I'd like to look at each of these and see if the local circuits are doing, um, are increasing in connectivity, decreasing in connectivity, and how that relates to how they responded to the um, long distance connections. So only this most forward region was showing increase in distance in um, large distance correlation. So I'm expecting that will show a different correlation pattern locally than these other two regions. And also our lab is doing something interesting with our mechanical engineer um, collaborators. So this is a mesoscope is what they're calling it. It's basically the entire microscope fit into this three gram little contraption that sits on the mouse's head. So that's great because you don't have to head fix them underneath a microscope to get your images. And you can have them walk around and do different things. And we also have something in here um, in our lab. It's a motorized treadmill. So with this and these free range, um, excuse me, free moving mice, I can, um, instead of waiting for them to spontaneously walk, I can turn the motor on and be like, okay, you're walking now. And when I can do that, I can also start inhibiting different regions with um, different drugs that I would inject to different parts of the brain to see how inhibiting different parts of the brain will affect the larger network. And I need a forced treadmill because otherwise, if you inhibit a critical region, they might never start walking. But if you force them to do it, um, they do like animals tend to just respond to forced locomotion. It doesn't matter what you do to their cortex. Um, so yeah, so I would like to see how that affects the networks. All right, and I'm done. Woo. Just one minute over technically. All right. All right, see there are dogs in here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was, um, uh, especially I, I liked all of the, the introduction on the methods and uh, the background and the different networks that you can have in the brain. And I have, I have similar kind of challenges. I speak to neuroscience people, so I'll definitely um, take some inspiration from that. But we're um, already over time, and I do want to give people the opportunity to ask questions if they have some. So I'm going to stop rambling if, if there's stuff coming up in the chat. Sorry, it's going over. Yeah. No worries. There's, Nick likes to. I was afraid. Mask 
<coughs> GoPro, he says. Yeah. <laughs> So, so um, then I'll start off by asking. So, so because I'm I'm mostly interested always in the methods. So, of my questions, they always po poke at why have you measured things like uh, computed things the way that you've done it. And so, I know that in terms of um, uh, so you looked at the eigenvector centrality on the undirected network that you got for uh, mm -hmm. correlations, and then you computed the um, uh, Granger causality. And I was wondering if you have looked at how the eigenvector centrality would change if you do it actually on the directed network that you get that way. All right, that's a great question that I should probably be asking you guys because I was running into problems that I can I couldn't do eigenvector vector centrality if there were negatives in the graph, and I was finding things online saying that I can't do directed eigenvector centrality. Oh. Um. So. Uh, remind me, you can you can have ne links with negative values, right? I have links with negative values right now. Yeah. Yeah. So eigenvector is going to be weird. Directed is okay, but links with negative values is not. Okay. So like, maybe I can. Yeah. So a, a good keyword for that, um, when networks are allowed to have links with negative values, they're often called signed networks. Mm -hmm. And so a good thing to Google, and I don't know about this, but what I would do is I would Google centrality in signed networks and see what came up. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay. Easily adapted for. Okay. Yeah, because I was finding things like, right. So I was finding things like degree centrality and link or between a centrality, but that's not exactly what I want in this. Yeah, because if, yeah. right? if you have something that's like, if you have a, a really negative link, then that node might actually have like a really low degree because that link like cancels out a bunch of positive links. Like it'll get, it'll get weird. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, uh, but yeah, like, like um, if, I'm sure someone's written a paper on this, uh, centrality okay. in the networks. Mm, okay, if, sounds if good. They have, if they haven't, let's do it. Okay, <laughs> yes, I'll write that down. Um, uh, I have a question after this question is answered. I, I think we, we've, we've talked about that. Okay. I just didn't want to make, I wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, being rude. Um, so a question I have for you is, uh, I was interested when you were talking about the Granger causality, mm -hmm. um, it's so funny. I always think of Harry Potter when I hear that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, I was kind of curious. So just to be clear, what I understood that you were doing is um, so you basically figure out how Y affects X, where Y and X are two different regions of the brain. And for some cases, you got positive mm -hmm. values, but some were bigger than the others. So you basically like subtracted. Yeah, Could you, that's mm -hmm. where I kind of so, got lost. Can you explain that a bit more? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So the Granger causality, it'll calculate it going for each direction, and it usually has positive values going in each direction. Um, and I'm guessing that's from this randomness of the data and like the limits of this technique. So I sub so for each pair, so if I wanted um, to know how 11 and 12 were relating to one another, I found the um, the value of the Granger going to 11 to 12 or from 11 to 12 and the and the value going from 12 to 11. And I subtracted those. So I'd have along here a um, just a single value to look at. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody does that, but it was easier to explain these to at least my advisor. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really like that. Okay, oh, that makes okay. more sense. Okay, you think so? Okay. And then, then from here, I uh, could be like, oh, yeah, I can see these relationships are positive. I don't have to look at this and this at the same time. Okay. And then a quick follow up to that, just to, so. To be clear, so suppose that I have like two strong causalities, but the difference between them is quite low in a sense. 
So mm-hmm. it doesn't like in the bottom figure or the bottom row, it doesn't account for the fact of the strength of those correlations to begin with. Is that correct? It just correct. takes into account the difference. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes sense. And Thanks. I was personally okay with that because I mean, I need to check it more in detail, but I would imagine this is all the causality stuff is came about in the last few weeks. So I still need to look up a lot of this, but I'm, guessing that in those cases the correlation is already very high so we're already getting that general information yeah. thank you yeah so from from what i learned about uh, the use of range of causality in neuroscience was that you use it as a measure of influence right and so therefore it's it's absolutely possible that you have positive values both ways so one neuron can influence like a can influence b and b can influence a mm-hmm. right uh, from from what you've done here, um, it seems that you're more interested in like who get who has more influence, yeah, on on their partners than the other way around. Like that's kind of what you get by doing this interaction. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think in that sense, it it, uh, it seems reasonable. But uh, before needing to write a paper on signed eigenvector centrality, you could just run eigenvector centrality on the uh, networks in the upper class, right? Because those are still positive. Okay. Okay. I can do that. Okay. You I think have... at one point I started to do that, but I started getting con- confused about like the directionality and signs mm-hmm. and the differences between them and things like that. Right. I was um. So so I, I I'm I'm doing like playing around with um directed functional connectivity a bit, and so like whenever I see something like that, I actually wonder to what extent what what do you learn from directed measures of functional connectivity versus the undirected ones. And so whenever I see that, I'm kind of looking for that a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to close it here. I'm going to uh, thank Sarah for this very excellent talk, uh, this very great introduction, and the mighty figures. <laughs> and um, then hope you all have a good rest of your week. And I'll see you again next week. Great talk, Sarah. Yeah, thanks.